There's the brown. In this video we're going to make a natural edged bowl. A natural edged bowl again? Yes, we'll make a natural edged bowl out of a piece of apple tree. Apple tree has this nice dark in the middle and the white around it. And of course we will leave the bark uh, on the piece of wood. Otherwise it wouldn't be a natural edged bowl. This is a piece I made uh, as an example piece in the bowl course we did last weekend over here. Um, and there was one piece left. This one. Piece of wood and a chuck and a gouge and much more we don't need. There we go. A one way chuck. And in that one way chuck I put a one way big bite spur. At one way they are pretty good in making very nice stuff and not telling anybody about it. But this is a nice thing. Nice thing. The big bite spur. It has got its teeth way out of the middle. Therefore it has got much more driving power. For instance if you compare it to this one. Let's find out where the center of this piece is. It is 24 centimeters like this. So I'll put a line at 12 centimeters. And well, we have to make a guess more or less 27. So somewhere here. So this should be more or less the center. I can just put it on this big spur. But now the uh, the center of the center, this little point here, I, I put it in there, but it's not, it's only in the bark. Ah, I, I don't want it. Because I find it much safer if the bark is off there. I also make a tiny little hole. Okay, let's put it on the chuck. And what I do now is look over here if this is more or less perpendicular to the spindle. Because it might as well be that there's a lot of bark here and hardly any over there. Because if it is something like this, for instance, if it is like this, this is way much more difficult to turn um, then when you have it mounted like this. And that also is the big pro of the big spur. You can move your piece of wood um, in several positions to make your ideal position. If you use a faceplate and you screw it on, there's no movement possible anymore. So let's put it secure in the chuck. Check what it is doing. Over here you see the two points are at the same level, at the same height. And on this side now you see, well it's not quite straight. <laughs> but I don't mind. I will turn that away. It will be, uh, it will do that slowly in the, in the beginning. But I don't mind. And we do that, well we, I do that, with a 16 millimeter bowl gouge, a fingernail, a fingernail bowl gouge. A fingernail means that I have a, a very long bevel to remove much material. And there has to be moved much material over here, so I like that. Okay, there we go. We're going to start over here, you see it's very unbalanced. Take some material off here and then we can uh, put speed up. There we go.
What do you say? It's snowing. <laughs> Let's stop the lathe for a moment and look at what we have got so far. Um, we see apple tree, nice brown, clean white, but we also see a rotten piece. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see what comes out. Um, for now I can take a few more passes. You see me turning left-handed. I have the, the, the bowl gouge on my left hip and I'm turning as if I was left-handed. Um, maybe if you're right-handed you think this is the way to do it. But as this piece is still wet and there's a lot of rubbish coming from it, bark and things out of here. Um, I don't want to stand here because it will spray in my face. Apple spray. <laughs> Apple spray. Okay, let's go on. By the way, it's a pity you can't smell it because you can really smell that it's an apple tree. It smells like apple. Well, a little bit. Put the speed up a little bit more. There we go again. Let me take this opportunity to explain a little bit about how I'm cutting. Everybody knows you have to have a bevel rubbing the wood. And the bevel rubbing the wood over here is actually in, is more or less in two places. Over here the bevel is this bevel on the top of my bow gouge, there, is pressing against the wood that I just cut away. And the other bevel here is vertically, so that the wood is falling into my gouge as a tomato on a knife that is vertically. If the knife is vertically and I drop the tomato, the tomato splits. If the knife is, let's say, under a 45 degree angle, the tomato splashes. Well, that is if it's not green, but, but anyway, you know what I mean. Let's finish the shape and then decide what we do over here with these two uh, well, entrance and exit, so to say. There's a lot of bad wood over here. Let's see what happens. First we continue. Another cut. Uh, it is time to decide um, what to do with this over here. Um, Lise is often standing filming in the flying zone of the of the of the shaving so to say so and I'm pretty fond of Lise so I decide now that I will take this whole piece off. Thank um, you. Yes, it's for your health Nis dear. <laughs> and also I think the shape will look better on the bow. Hey, well, hey look Um, that's a good idea, we don't do this. I'm going to get myself a big chisel and take some rotten wood out of here. <laughs> I was almost dead on my camera. Well, that would have been worse.
Rewind and start again. I don't have a center point now anymore, of course, but that doesn't matter that much because um, I was not at the end yet. And I well, that's pretty good. There we go again. Make a few more passes. You can't have more fun than throwing away these wet shavings. Here's a thing that often happens when you're making natural edged bowls. You're coming with your gouge from this side and you're creating tear out here on the, on the bark of the bowl. If you have a very sharp gouge and, um, and, and you have it and you have the bevel exactly cutting on the wood, then you could make this less. There's two things to uh, avoid this. One is cutting against the grain, but there's also a con on cutting against the grain, and that is that you open up the wood fibers. So if you do cut against the grain make this cut until you are at the tenon of your bow now you have cut the whole piece against the grain, meaning it's, uh, all the wood is cut in the same direction. Because if I only would cut from here to there against the grain, and then again from there to there with the grain, there's a big chance that when you have uh, stopped sanding and putting an oil on it, there's a line over here where you can see that was against the grain and that was against the grain and that was cut with the grain. So make your, make your cut all the way with the grain or all the way against the grain. The other way of not damaging the bark is cutting with the grain with a very sharp uh, gouge. This is, called, is what I call my finishing gouge. This is a very small gouge, it's 30 millimeter bar, and it has a 45 degree angle here, just under 45 degree angle here, and the wings are even sharper than 45 degrees. And with that gouge, I can make a very precise cut and leave the bark as, as it is. I'll show you. You see a nice clean cut with the bark hardly damaged. Now we're going to make a tenon on this bowl, um, but as you see there's still some rotten wood 
that I would like to take away first. Hold on a minute. That's enough to make a tenon. There's my tenon. And now I see that because of the rotten peas, the tenon has moved much into the bowl. And I'm not satisfied with this curve. I want the bottom to be smaller, so I'm going to take some wood away over there. Nice finishing cut again. So, that's what I like better. Always when I make natural edged bowls, I say, um, also to the people in the course, I always try to keep one radius over here. So not first a flat, a straight line and then a small curve or something. No, one curve going from the bottom to the top. The pro of that is that no matter on what side you look at the bowl, it always looks good. So it's mounted in the chuck and the hollowing process will start now. Let's get this out of the way. Bowl gouge again. Can I get in the middle? Lower my tool rest a little bit. And there we go. There's the brown. see what's in there. It might be a nail or something. Well, don't know what it was, this, this black spot in the wood, but it dulled my bowl gouge. So I'm going to resharpen it a little bit. Um, it's 
It's very practical if you have it on wheels. Lots of people have a block of wood to get this protrusion uh, on the right dimensions, but I have a hole, a hole underneath my grinder. I can't lose a hole and if I would have done this with a piece of wood, I would have been searching all day for that piece of wood. Anyway, ah, and the CBN wheel is ruined in the last course. Anyway. I'm going to try and make the wall a little bit thinner and get an even wall thickness for the whole bowl. Here's lots of material that I can put out without thinking and now we start. First I press the bevel on the tip of my bow gouge against the wood, then withdraw my bevel until the end and then I go in again. That's a lot of mess. Over here, I'm a little bit thicker than over here. So let's make a very thin cut down there. That should be it. Brilliant. First piece is finished, now I go uh, further down into the bowl. I don't do that at one in one go, because if I'm very thin over here already, this wall will move already. So, and if this wall moves, this thin wall, if it moves, I can't make a proper cut, cut anymore. So, now the first part here is on the right thickness and I move on to the next part. One cut to go, hopefully. And measuring again. Still a little bit thick. One more. One more. Famous last words. One more. Keep that. Uh, now get the bottom smooth. I'm 
I'm going to do one more cut on the bottom. Case is bored, all these natural edge bowls. I'm going to make one more pass on the bottom of the bowl. And well, you, you can hear it's already moving. If you're too slow making a bowl like this, the walls over here will start to deform already because they're drying, of course. So if that happens, just spray water and the water will penetrate the wood and go on again. Normally what we do now is sand it and then uh, take the tenon off. But I think if we take the tenon off I will make the whole bowl round so that it won't stand steady on, the, on your table. But it well, can roll in any direction. Time to take the bottom off. Well not the bottom, the tenon. I have all kinds of methods to clamp this bowl. I even have vacuum, but we do it the El Cheapo way um, with a block of wood that must be in my workshop now for over 10 years, maybe 15 years already or something like that. And we just press it against this block of wood with, by the way, this, when I was a was a four-year-old child, this was my blanket. So this blanket is at least 30 years old. <laughs> that was a good joke. Um, it's a pity that I took away my center point. So I, it will be quite difficult to relocate it very precise. Um, normally it doesn't have to be that precise because we're on, only going, if this moves a little bit it doesn't matter because we're only working on the bottom of the bowl. But like I said I want to round it off. So we want to have it a bit better centered than just a little bit centered. Nice. Yes. <laughs> I told you in one time. <laughs> yeah, I didn't expect that. And now I'm going to try and round it off. I'm going to do that by some light pull cuts. One very light pass.
That's nice. Send it again. Take it out, a little bit, manual things to do. Ain't that a cute little bowl. Good. Well, that is my little cute bowl. You can uh, now oil it and put it away. The oil will uh, slow down the drying process, which will make sure that it, well, it doesn't make sure, but it will probably avoid the bowl from cracking. Um, but in a few days when the wood is really dry, you have to then do your final finishing. So send it by hand and maybe put one or more um, coats of oil on it. And then you have, I think, a cute little ball. That's all, see you next time, bye bye. <laughs>